thank you. Mm. And thank you, everyone, that's taken the time to actually um, come this um, evening um, in the UK. And I know there is some international as well. So thank you for actually attending. As you can see, uh, building on from what Elizabeth spoke about and Sue, postnatal care. But obviously, I've only got a short period of time, so we can only do a glimpse. So I'll start. Postnatal care then. Let's look at the concept of postnatal care. It's to assist a mother, her baby and the family towards obtaining optimum health and well-being status. And I've put well-being status in because it's just as important as the health. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in this discussion. So what does that mean, what we're doing? Well, women's bodies have to recover sufficiently to return to a non-pregnant status. And the baby is healthy and thriving, feeding well, and there is a developing secure attachment. So the definition, this does vary, but it's a period of time following birth which care and support is given. Um, I won't really go into too much of the history because Elizabeth has covered um, that, but usually in many cultures it is around 40 days. However, it can take much longer. You only have to look at Deborah Bick's work, uh, Julie Ray when she's around, Carol Bradshaw, Bradshaw, who, oh sorry, Bedwell, and they listened to women and looked, and they would say really about a year. And when you think about it, I've done a lot of service development projects about around maternal health and well-being, and particularly around musculoskeletal, which we haven't mentioned, the relaxing hormone. It can take a good six months, and we have to be aware of this when women complain of bad backs um, and, and issues. And I remember my midwifery mentor saying to me, Mary, nine months, the pregnancy, why do we push women? And I think as a researcher, it's like a histogram. It does take that time to go back to non-pregnant status. Okay, then, so just quickly, historically, the rite of passage. Now, I want you to look not from, I know I'm in, we're back, I'm in the UK now, and yes, we'll look at it nationally, but I want you to have much more of an international lens around postnatal care. And postnatal care was and is a key strategy to reduce maternal and newborn mortality and morbidity. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that shortly. There are differences and commonalities within societies and cultures that we have to consider. But basically, I'm building on what Elizabeth was saying and what Sue picked up on. It's much around rest period, the nurturing of women. Food, they have mentioned food, and yes, foods that are encouraged and foods that are prohibited. There's a lot around food, social seclusion, and that's really like protective rituals and to prevent infections, and obviously around personal hygiene. But very importantly, the celebration of a new social status. And I was just thinking about this today. When I was educated and trained to be a midwife in the mid-80s, it was the joy of birth and afterwards and going to see them. Now I hear a lot of fear. And I was saying, how are we going to go back to that joy of birth? The emphasis as well is on avoiding ill health in later life. That is our public health role. And that is historically there. So what I have actually quoted and said before, and I've had many discussions with Sue Down about this, the importance of mothering the mother. Now, you can see this slide here, and I'm using slides that women that I have actually been, it's been an honour to their birth or I've cared for them. And this is a home birth in South Australia. But look at the family around her. Her sister is in the water with her in her bather. She is a shamanic midwife. And I had to actually look that up, I'll to say, with a spiritual approach. But look how the mother is being mothered. And that is the start of postnatal care. And she's giving kangaroo care, very importantly. And the young niece, I was thinking, oh, I think we've got a midwife um, there in future. So let's reflect on the past, learning the cues. This is me back in 1986. I know you'll be trying to work my age out now. 
but I was um, a student midwife, as you can see with my little hat on. And I didn't know this photograph was being taken. It was being taken by the father. This is where I was learning to be with woman, not doing to the woman, being with woman, very importantly. And look at that secure attachment that we're talking about. A nice, quiet, tranquil home setting. It was my first home birth. And I was there sharing this experience with the woman. And the mother is there focusing on the baby and the baby is, is focusing on mum. And it is a beautiful moment there that was captured um, and, and not, neither of us actually knew. And we built up that trust and rapport through antenatal care, birth and then postnatally. So we will reflect on the present then. And I did say we would just go through a glimpse because the presentation is short. I mentioned maternal mortality and morbidity, and this does shock me. Remember through the international lens, lifetime mm -hmm. risk of maternal death in well-developed industrialized countries, one in 4,000 versus one in 51 in countries that are classified as least developed. So that's in your low and middle resource countries. Yes, um, postnatal period, life-threatening conditions do occur, and this is the causes for a lot of these maternal deaths through hemorrhage, thromboembolism, infection, eclampsia. They are greater risks. But also in the Western world and the developing countries, yes, our mortality rates have gone down. However, our morbidity is there and has gone up. And we do have maternal mental health problems and we have had an increase in infections as well. It is noteworthy, though, when we're looking at postnatal care and we're saying today, tonight, who cares? Most maternal deaths occur in the first month following birth. And nearly half are within the first 24 hours. Then two thirds occur in that first week. It is vitally important that women around the world get care particularly in that first week following birth. And what is really um, important that many of these maternal deaths are preventable. And we'll go back to about women's place in society. We engaging and educating girls is vital to improve maternal health and well-being, particularly in low and middle resource countries. And then yes, education is is key. As they always say, you educate a woman, you educate a society. There's no bias there, of course. <laughs> so WHO in 2014 recommended then, because of the maternal mortality and morbidity rates, in low to middle resource countries, provide postnatal care in the first 24 hours. And that includes a clinical examination undertaken within the first hour of birth. Here in the high developed countries, we take that for granted. In many countries, this does not happen for many women, but it is now, it's recommended. If there has been a home birth, the first postnatal contact should be as early as possible. They also recommend extra contact in that first 24 to 48 hours is desirable. Sometimes we can't reach women. And yes, we do live in a digital world now in the 21st century. So mobile phone-based postnatal care contacts have been recommended. Also telehealth. And we know that we actually can do it. And I just got back from Australia. And if the women are in the outback or in the rural areas, telehealth sometimes um, has, will happen. But ideally, four postnatal contacts are recommended. And I've just been listening, obviously, to the examples that Elizabeth gave. And I know in the Sunday Times only this week, women have been there and it's been on Twitter that they've been left on a postnatal ward. Is there one midwife or two midwives that are working on that postnatal ward with how many women, how many babies? Even the lodgers, as we used to say, the babies that are going to be adopted, all that workload. I ask a question for the discussion, postnatal care in a, in a ward, or are we better if there is no problems to actually go home, 
from birthing units and labour and ward to a family and to peers and to community, which is historically what has happened. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about family inclusive care. So we have the nice guidelines, don't we? Um, we're, we're fortunate to have um, an independent health service that looks at the evidence. I know SIGN do um, guidelines in Scotland, mm -hmm. and I know Australia do look at some of our guidelines, but they don't actually have a specific health authority independent that actually does look at the evidence. And they do recommend routine postnatal care for women and babies, and they say should receive eight weeks after the birth. And that involves the organisation and the delivery of identifying common problems that Elizabeth has discussed, but more serious problems, but also how to help parents form strong relationships with their babies and recommendations on emotional attachment and baby feeding. This is um, one of the mums that I cared for um, in Australia. And look at the kangaroo care. Look at, again, that important moment of mother and baby, they shouldn't be separated. And I will discuss that because this has happened during this COVID pandemic. So postnatal care in high resource countries, and this is one of the families that um, I had the honour to meet and to discuss um, their plans and the care that they were going to have postnatally. And this is in the Emirates. This is in Rosh al -Khaima. And I put that up because look, look at the proud, look at the joy of that baby, the new status that I was talking about early. Um, however, in high resource countries, as Elizabeth said, it's often referred to as the Cinderella of maternity services or the poor cousin. And ideally, sometimes people really uh, refer it sometimes to as the fourth, fourth trimester, the postnatal care. However, we do know that many mothers do not feel supported, they're disappointed with the care particularly when they've had intervention, an instrumental or a caesarean section, do feel less satisfied with their postnatal care. We also know that women from what we call, and I, I've got this term when I first went to Australia, called backgrounds. And I like this. Um, it covers everyone, all cultures, culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds are at increased risk of physical and mental health problems. We need to start listening and looking at mother's experiences because this needs to be considered when we are actually planning postnatal care services. I put this up because I do have and I'm doing a lot of research at the moment in maternal mental health. We know the evidence is there. Approximately one in seven women will have a mental health problem during the childbirth continuum. We know women who already have mental health problems are at increased risk during pregnancy. We know that it is a continuum, is mental health. So prior to being pregnant, it's approximately 5% for anxiety and depression in women. This does increase to about 8 to 6%, the evidence shows, and then again to 13% in the year following birth. So that leads me on to what does the future hold? What can we do to provide the best postnatal care possible? And yes, there is a lot of women disappointed, but there is a lot of women and families that are very happy with their postnatal care. As you can see, this young family in Brazil, when I was in Sao Paulo, that actually had a wonderful experience and they had particularly the care of the family. So I just want to mention the Sustainable Development Goals. I know I think there is about 69 in total, but I want us to focus on Goal 3, Good Health and Wellbeing. It's a tall order by 2013. We're 2022 now. So just in less than nine years, they want to reduce the global maternal mortality ratio to less than 70 per 100,000 births and also end preventable deaths in newborns and children under five. And the countries are aiming to reduce ne neonatal mortality 12 per thousand by 2030. I think that needs a discussion. It needs striving for, but will we, will we make that? It may be that we have some further development 
goals with different time periods. So what can midwives do? I'm coming from a midwife's perspective because I've been a midwife most of my career. We do need to raise the awareness of the importance of maternal health and well-being. And I have wrote a lot about this. And I want you to focus on the parity of esteem concept. Now, the first person to bring this up and it drew my attention was Norman Lamb when he was the shadow health minister. And then Lucinda Berger took it on in Liverpool when she was a, a Labour MP there. And then I took it on with my son, um, Scott Steen, who's a psychologist. And basically, it's equal weighting for physical health and mental health. And often, with the medicalization of childbirth, this is not the case. We need to focus on maternal and family inclusive care. I have done a lot of work uh, with Duncan Fisher and other international researchers and educators. And there's a link on this slide, which is familyincluded.com. And if you look this up, there is a lot of good studies that have been summarized. And most of them are in low and middle class, middle developing countries, which shocked me. Where's, where is it happening in the high developing countries? We really have to focus on local community involvement. Yes, I saw that um, Marion Knight mentioned about all the professionals working together. It's not just professionals, it's everyone. It's everyone's responsibility. And we really have to look at community involvement, befriending and supporting women. A really good project in Northern Ireland, the community mothers demonstrated this. Who is the mother and family going to listen to? The health professional? Who they're going to be influenced by? Or their family? We have to look at this. And that means that we need to work better with what we call NGOs, your non-government organisations, or you might refer to them as the third sector charities in the UK. Community engagement is vital. And if you do not take anything else from my presentation tonight, remember this. It takes a village to bring a child up. And sometimes in the capitalist consumer and Western world, we have forgotten this. However, I do have to mention the impact of COVID-19. Modified healthcare globally. And we are up against all health services. So there has been restrictive practices in maternity care that Elizabeth mentioned. And this has affected women's decisions and choices that have been limited. We have to learn lessons here. There has been an increase in medicalization. There, uh, yes, a knee-jerk reaction. And there has actually been reported now the European Centre of Disease Prevention and Control in 2020, there has been an increase in cesarean section in some countries. There's also been reports about babies being separated from mothers. And we have to question this and why and the evidence to support this. Yes, we need a balance with, like you said, safety, effectiveness, what um, Elizabeth mentioned, but it's that nurturing and that care and it all is stems from continuity of care. Postnatal care is part of the childbirth continuum. And we need to engage with fathers, families, and communities. So I draw your attention to the NMC standards of proficiency for midwives 2019. And I've had to come back and update myself with this. Continuum of care, it's knitted throughout, isn't it? However, there is a change, there is a shift, because you remember throughout um, the last few decades, it has really been focused on clinical risk. We're risk averse. So we need to address this. And it has. There's no talk of women being high risk or low risk. It's more around universal care. All women are vulnerable, but some have disadvantages. And it is based on the Lancet series and also the framework for quality maternity and newborn health. So it does say the care for all women and additional care for women and newborn infants with complications. And I would recommend that you do read it. I will be reading it uh, as being an educator and a researcher, but I have had a look through um, and I think it's more positive. Now, I want to draw your attention to the State of the World's Midwifery 2021 report. 
Um, mm, remember the 2030 um, development go sustainable development goals? Well, this is what we're up against. Sexual reproductive, maternal, neonatal and allied health workforce in 194 countries of the world. It is estimated that there is 1.1 million workers short. Guess what? Highest shortage? Midwives. 900,000. Therefore, there is urgent investment into education and training. If we're short of midwives, who's going to educate them? We need educators to train and educate midwives. Management. How are we going to lower it? I've got many friends in midwifery management and they are struggling too. Regulation, the working environment, our leadership and governance also really needs looking at and service delivery. We know that midwives with support from others because we cannot do it alone could deliver 90% of the sexual, reproductive, maternal, neonatal and allied health interventions. Yet, at the moment, currently, we actually deliver 10%. We're 10% representative of this workforce. And this lack of work to meet the demands for 2030. And then to top it off with our COVID-19 pandemic, have we not? That has reduced the health workforce. And it does need to be prioritised. And we have had, as with other health professionals, some midwives that have lost their lives throughout the world and it's and it, this report is dedicated to the health workers that have lost their lives during the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is my last slide, the future and I was trying to remember when I did this um, and it was, I was at Chester University then, I just left Leeds, St James's and we did a big campaign for more midwives so it would have been in about 2009 I just want to quote the NMC proficiency standards. Evidence shows the positive contribution midwives make to the short and long-term health and well-being of women, newborn, infants and families. We have to, we're not very good at campaigning, but we have to have a voice. We have to start, I've noticed lately, I saw in um, the Houses of Parliament, that some midwife, some MPs were starting to take up this. Mm. We've seen that. I've seen it in Australia too. Mm. And we have to do it. We, we, yes, we educate and train to nurture and care, but we have to actually look at this. We have to look at media. I'm not really with the social media, but I'm having to think, well, yes, this is the way we are communicating if we're going to have to make a difference. Postnatal care is part of the continuum. Yes, there is problems. There's always been issues, but there are things. And I want to just quote what my mother once said to me when I was a young girl. Out of small acorns, big oak trees grow. <laughs> oak tree is an English tree, actually. It's one of the four. Ash, beech, elm and oak. I remember learning that um, at school. So we can make the difference. And we have to start somewhere. Thank you. And thank you all for listening. And we'll hopefully take some questions now.